If you would open your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, my name is Joshua Lewis. Uh, I've spoken here a couple times. Uh, many of you guys know me. We're good friends, so we go back. Uh, I won't do big of a spiel. Uh, I do a theology podcast. You can check it out if you want to learn about theology, history, and the gifts of the Spirit. It's called Remnant Radio. It's good fun. Well, seriously, but we don't take ourselves very seriously, so uh, just enjoy it if that's something you're into. Um, I'm going to keep moving this until it... There it is. It's flat. It's level. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking uh, about uh, the, the book of Colossians, this couple verses. Uh, chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 16 through 23. And then we're going to go chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So that's kind of where we're going to be today. But I want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to the Church of Colossae before we dive too deep into it. The Church of Colossae uh, is experiencing what is often called Judaizers, uh, people who have converted from the Christian faith, or from the Jewish faith into the Christian faith, but they're holding on to specific Jewish traditions that they then want to impose upon uh, the Christian believers, things like circumcision, uh, new, mean, new moon feasts, festivals, uh, certain Sabbath days as a required observation for Christian living. Now, uh, we read a lot about the Judaizers in the book of Galatian, uh, Galatians, uh, but here in the book of Colossians, there's a different sect of Jewish believers here. Uh, this group of Jewish believers, uh, they have a kind of mysticism about them that's unique. We, we, we have a term that we use often because I know the context of the church I'm in. I'm sure many of you have heard the term Gnostic. Um, it, it means secret knowledge. There was a group of proto-Gnostics, the earliest Gnostics coming from Platonic thought, coming from Greek philosophy, uh, and they were invading lots of different religious spaces. Typically, when we talk about Gnostics, we're talking about Christians that live in the second, third century, uh, the Nag Hammadi texts, these, these groups of people who are coming into the Christian church and spreading lies about spiritual mysticism and, and different ways to achieve knowledge and salvation. Uh, however, proto-Gnosticism or early Gnosticism existed you know, well uh, throughout the Second Temple Judaism and into uh, the launching of Christian faith. So uh, these early Gnostics are spreading these kinds of things within Judaism and attaching uh, kind of uh, mystical hierarchy when it comes to angels and talking about angels. They're, they're talking about knowledge that comes uh, by transmission of certain visions and dreams and the way that you come about giving those visions and dreams by following very specific rituals. So that kind of gives you a bit of a context. Uh, Paul didn't uh, plant this church. Uh, a, a brother, a partner in a uh, ministry planted this church. He heard about this in prison. So Paul is actually writing this from prison. Uh, someone said, hey, Paul, I planted this church. These are the, the issues that we're facing. I'm really concerned. What kind of advice would you give this church? And, and, and he kind of introduces uh, uh, this book in that context. So let's start off in uh, chapter two, uh, and we're going to read 16 through 23, and that's what we're going to we're going to read there, and then we'll just pause, and then we'll read. Uh, actually, let's read it all. We'll read it all. Uh, but it, as we do this, can y'all do me a favor, and we'll just rise if you can, if you can stand. I know we've we've sang uh, songs, and some of us our legs are tired. If you can stand, please do with me. We want to honor the word of God as we as we approach the text. It's a, it starts off this way. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food or drink with regards to festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head with whom the whole body is nourished and knit together uh, though its joints and, uh, through its joints and ligaments, growing uh, with a growth that is from God. Uh, if, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, uh, why, uh, sorry, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish uh, as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, promoting self-made religion and asceticism uh, and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your minds on the things that are are above, not on the things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then also, uh, so then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of God. You may be seated. And I know we've prayed a couple of times, but again, as it is my tradition, I'm going to pray after the word has gone forward. Lord, we've eaten from your table. Lord, we've, we've taken from your cup. Um, and even if your spirit isn't in this sermon, at least it was in the table. Uh, it, at least it was in the worship. And, and Lord, as your word goes forward this morning, I ask that you would, in the same way you've met us in worship, in the same way you've met us in the table, Lord, that you would attach yourself to this word in such a powerful way. Lord, I ask that people who hear your word go forth today uh, would receive from it and that your spirit would transform hearts and change minds. Lord, there are people, I believe, present in the room who have struggled and wrestled with the very things the Church of Colossae have wrestled with, and they keep falling short. They keep stumbling. And Lord, today could be that day that they break free of the lie, they break free of the bondage, they break free of the sin, uh, and and are people whose breath is taken once again uh, from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So Lord, I ask that you would just inspire inspire our just attraction. I, I, take our breath away. That's what I've been praying, Lord. Take our breath away with your beauty and your glory and help us fix our gaze on you. And I ask that your word as it goes forward it bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold and it wouldn't return void. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, this is, this is going to be fun. I'm going to talk about three kind of, uh, three things from these passages um, that I want to kind of pay special attention to. In the first passage that we read, 16 through 23, I want to talk about the warning. Uh, and then we're going to focus on one through four for the rest of the sermon. And, and I want to talk about the way out and the way forward. So there are three things that we're going to take from the passage we just read. There's a warning, there's a way out, and there's a way forward. The warning is of that, of this mysticism that we spoke of earlier, this ritualism. You'll see uh, here in the passage, uh, he talks about no food or drink. Uh, he, he's specifically talking about the Jewish custom that they would have. They were in these pagan societies that were offer, often offering up food to false gods. So many Jewish uh, believers in those days would abstain from, hey man, it's good to see you. Uh, it, it's good, it's good. It's, I didn't notice you there earlier. So uh, uh, they would abstain from food and drink because they didn't want to eat anything that was offered up to false gods. So they just said, hey, we're just going to eat vegetables because those things aren't offered up to false gods. So we'll just completely abstain altogether from, from all meat, from all wine. We'll completely abstain from all of those things. Now, there's also a connection, however. Uh, uh, Many scholars see this passage, this latter passage, uh, do not taste, do not handle, do not touch. That that one's referring probably to abstaining from food that's offered up to idols. But this other verse on food and drink, they believe it's probably referencing to fasting, uh, that, that the people believed that they could conjure supernatural experiences through specific sacrifices. Hey, there's a new moon festival that's coming up. Let's make sure that we prepare to fast so that we can conjure some kind of spiritual experience. So there was a ritualism here. Uh, This mysticism is really defined by these three things. One being ritualism. The second one being asceticism. I'm going to lose this, guys. I really, I had it on all the way through worship and it keeps falling off. Okay. Ritualism, spiritualism, and a a kind of myth that, that, that teeters on speculation. Just made up doctrine. That, that they would speculate on. So ritualism, asceticism, and mysticism or speculation. Now, some of you might be saying, what is asceticism? It's, it's this idea that, again, I will sacrifice. The, the, the desert fathers were ascetics. They separated themselves from the known world and lived in like monasteries. The, 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 the monastic movement that you see within Roman Catholicism was an attempt of asceticism. Now here, uh, I, I wish that my brothers who you know, chose to uh, castrate themselves with bricks, would only have read this passage here that says that it has an appearance of wisdom, right, but does nothing in the actual crucifixion of the flesh. Uh, the, the kind of ascetic life, it looks like it promises something. I, I grew up in a very classical Pentecostal church, and one of the things that we were constantly doing is, what are you watching on TV, and, and what are you eating? And But you better not be drinking. You better not be touching that. You better not be going there, because there was this idea that the spiritual life we lived could be somehow contaminated by the things that we put inside of our belly. 
that if we eat this or we, we drink that, somehow the, the spiritual life uh, it, it can be contaminated, which, which really suggests, and, and this, is where, this is where things get hairy, the, the Judaizing uh, cults, they want you to do something to be saved. But within that, many of us here go, well, I'm not trying to earn my salvation. I'm not doing anything to earn my salvation. But when you ask the question in reverse, can you do something that will cause you to lose it? Is there a specific action that would cause you to walk outside of the Christian faith? And if, that's the, if the answer is yes, well, then you always have to work to not do that thing. So, so, so if you're, you're sitting here and you're saying, well, the, 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 the Judaizers back then were making sure that we're following new moons and Sabbaths and all of these right things, but I don't wrestle with that personally. Well, if you don't read every single morning when you wake up, do you feel like less of a Christian? If you haven't prayed regularly or didn't go on your, your three fasts that you planned for this year, do you feel less than or other than? Do you measure yourself by how many people got healed this week rather than last week? Do you measure yourself based on the kinds of visions or supernatural experiences that other men and women of God have had and then compare yourself to those people and view yourself as less than? This is the same kind of thing that the Judaizers were promoting and prompting within these systems uh, in the early church. This is a system of merit. How do I do something in order to earn something. Uh, have you ever heard the story of Icarus? Icarus, I think, really uh, perfectly illustrates this. Now, Icarus, I'm not going to tell you how he got up in this castle. It, it involves the creation of a minotaur, and it's, it's pretty gross. But uh, Icarus and, and his father are, are put up in this, this lofty tower, uh, and they're imprisoned, and they're trying to figure out a way to escape. And there's some pigeons and birds that kind of, you know, hang out on the top of this castle, and they grab all the feathers, and they, they put them all together, and they melt the wax, and they create these wings, and they decide that they're going to fly off of this, uh, this tower. Now, over and over, Icarus's father had basically break, broken the created order, broken natural law, and, and his idea is that I can be like God, and I can create, and I can soar beyond what has been given to me, right? What's what, what's what the natural order has demanded of me. In the same way that the mystics are saying, God has given us a way to approach his throne, but we are going to violate that. We're going to find certain practices that will get us there outside of that created order. Well, the same thing that happens to the mystics, that happens to Icarus. Icarus uh, uh, is told by his father, hey, if you fly too low, the water will get your wings wet and you'll crash and burn. And if you get too high, the sun will melt your wings and you'll fall to your death. Well, as Icarus jumps out of the building, doesn't heed his father's uh, insight, his wisdom, and he continues to fly higher and higher and higher until his wings melt. And he falls and he crumbles and dies. Here in the first century, the mystics are doing the very same thing. They acknowledge that there are somehow spiritual principalities out there and angels. And you see here in the text that they go on worshiping angels. Verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, the worship of angels, going on about visions puffed up without reason in his sensuous mind. So over and over, they're pulling data points and teaching people based off of visions and dreams and worship of angels. These are things, in the same way that Icarus was commanded not to fly to the, to the heights, God has commanded us not to go beyond what is written in the scriptures. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, do not go beyond what is written. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, he says, when one prophet speaks, others are to judge and weigh what is being said. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 through 22, he says uh, that, that, that a prophetic word that's to go forward, you are to cling to what is good and to reject what is evil. Just because it's supernatural doesn't mean it's God. And these mystics, they were, they were saying, hey, you... I might go handheld, guys. There's a clip here. Yeah, I'll just I'll embrace that clip. Y'all, y'all, give me a second. This whole sermon's on. It's not justified by your work, you know. And now I can get the clip on. Okay, I'm going handheld. Where are we at? Thank you. Is that what that is? You can mute the earpiece if you want.
Thanks, man. Cool. So, as stated earlier, so in this passage, the mystics are encouraging a kind of system where, you, again, you sacrifice, but these sacrifices give you access to secret knowledge. Now, one of the things that we've done in our studies and in our, in our teaching and charismatic uh, doctrine here uh, on Remnant Radio and other things that we've done is we've discovered that there's an entire branch of the charismatic movement that says you don't have revival because you haven't sacrificed enough. And here are the things that you have to do. Now, now the Bible gives you a clear way of getting to God, and it's through Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. That's great. But if you really want to get your prayers answered, what you have to do is you have to go into these secret courts in heaven, right? You have to align yourself with the voices of angels. You have to avoid, align yourself with the voices of martyrs, dead people, right? You got to go talk to the dead. You've got to align yourself with finances. Now, there's practices that have melded in with these spiritual experiences. I believe modern the modern charismatic movement is at a crossroads, the same crossroads that the Church of Colossae was at. It's really difficult to sit in a place um, where you believe in healing and you're not seeing healing. To sit in a place where you believe in prophecy, but you don't know what the future holds. It's very difficult to sit in a place where you believe that God has the power to transform the lives of your loved ones and your loved ones are still lost. And then when someone comes along and says, I have the secret sauce for you. If you would just do X, then this will happen. It's a system of merit that doesn't trust God's work. It's a system that trusts your work. And and I really felt called, you know, this week as I was praying, man, what what am I going to share this week to my friends at Wellspring? I felt that there was this stern warning. Not that anyone here is practicing these things, but a strong warning. Don't allow, hey, uh, you know, you've got this kind of sickness. Let me grab this oil. Let me grab this crystal. Let me mix in this weirdness into what we're doing as we pray for the sick, as we go after the lost. A strong warning that Wellspring uh, needs to stand for truth in this space. You need to stand for some, you've got to, there's a warning to the church of Colossae and there's a warning for you today. Don't look to your works as a means of some kind of spiritual identity. I know we're charismatics. We believe in the healing of the sick. We believe in prophecy. We believe in the supernatural power of God. But what we can't do, what we can't do is begin to judge ourselves based off of the amount of that stuff in our lives. There's such a strong danger. Okay, we're going to pursue it. We're going to pursue it. We're going to pursue it. But we're not as charismatic as that church. And then we start asking, well, how do we get there? And then that's where the compromises come. We have to have an eager and watchful eye. Eager and watchful eye. When... We have, uh, again, worked through our material. We've, we've come across popular charismatic leaders saying that we have to redeem Wicca in the New Age. There are practices within these mystical arts that we need to begin to apply to the church, but we have to redeem them, wash them in the blood, as it were. The Bible talks about syncretism, and that's what this is. We have to keep an eye out for these things. What we can't allow is our aiming for greatness to prevent us from hitting what is good. Don't allow your aim for greatness to prevent you from doing what's good. But there is a way out. And this is where I wanna wanna hang out because I really believe that Paul is contrasting a worldly charismatic experience with a godly charismatic example. You would think that Paul would say, hey, here are the things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't make big deals of festivals and new moons and Sabbaths. You shouldn't make a big deal of worship of angels. You shouldn't make a big deal about visions and dreams. You shouldn't go on to do those things. You know, you would expect someone, I mean, I would, I would do this. You need to take a break from the supernatural stuff. But then he responds by saying, set your mind on things above. Set your mind on where Christ is. Is he, he doesn't say, stop doing the charismatic thing. He says, start doing the charismatic thing well. 
So as that there is a warning, there is a way out. Let's keep our eyes on Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If the warning in chapter 2, 16 through 23, is all about your works, then the exhortation here in this passage is all about Christ's works. He says in verse 18, going on about visions, puffed up without reason, worship of angels. But here he says, risen with Christ, seated with Christ, returning with Christ, hidden with Christ. Paul's contrast. You don't sacrifice food and drink. Christ has already sacrificed. You don't earn approval. You're already seated with Christ in heavenly places. You don't display your greatness amongst others. Christ's glory is what is on display, and you're hidden in that. This is, I think, the cuts of the message this morning. Your identity is inherited. It is not merited. Your identity is inherited. It is not merited. I am a man. It's part of my identity. I'm a man. When did I get that identity? I inherited it from my parents. When my chromosomes were formed, it wasn't something I worked for. It's something I was given. I'm also an American. This is not something I worked for either, but it's part of my identity. I'm a Westerner. I inherited this. My my view on wealth, whether it be a, a wealth mentality or a poverty mentality, that was inherited by my family. These things are things that we are given at birth. We know because of Romans that we inherited a nature of sin. But in the same way, our identity as Christians, we have inherited because of Christ's work. You inherit your identity. You don't merit your identity. I I had to I had to make a couple of uh, embarrassing messages to people I had discipled over the years. Um, I was talking to Steve earlier. Just, I had wished I had the opportunity to look at every person I ever preached to and ask for forgiveness. Uh, I remember when I uh, was 21, I was a youth pastor, and I kind of explained to everyone that God always wants to pour out revival. And the only thing that's preventing us from receiving revival is us. Because if God always wants to do it, that must mean he's just waiting for a place to pour it out. So we need a sacrifice, and we need to go after it. And I just started explaining, well, you know, I, I, I pray four hours a day. I read my Bible for three hours a day. I just seek God, and I'm a full-time youth pastor with no kids, you know, newly married. And I'm sitting here heaping burdens on people. I'm a, I'm a modern-day Judaizer. I'm placing a burden upon people and saying, it's your work that ushers in this thing, not Christ's work. And Paul's response is, get your eyes fixed on Jesus. I tell you, I was so tired and so weary (laughs) because I leave my, my job as a youth pastor. I start working in the secular space. I start having kids. I'm installing soap dispensers in bathrooms in public high schools. So if if you go to a DISD high school, I probably installed your soap dispenser. You know, if if, if you're in the Dallas Independent School District, I probably installed the chemical dispensers in the custodian's, you know, closet hall. You know, uh, I I swept chimneys for a couple of years. I put on roofs. I, I I was a salesman for a roofing company. I worked laborious jobs. And I'll tell you, I felt the weight of I'm not praying enough every single day. I felt the weight of I don't get to evangelize like I used to. I don't get to disciple like I used to. I felt the weight and the burden of I used to do this and now I do this. And God used to be really proud of me when I was able to do these things, but now I'm hindered. And I begin to look at my family as a burden 
I was bitter that my children were taking my time away from prayer. And, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I feel the weight of it because I remember, I, I remember the moment it happened. I'm listening to a podcast called Theocast. And I had just started Remnant Radio and I'm listening to a podcast and they're talking about piety and pietism. And that, hey, living holy is good, live holy. But if you're living holy as a means of justification, your, your, your salvation is on the knife's edge. You'll never make it. And I remember sitting on a ladder, you know, <laughs> if you know anything about cleaning out uh, uh, dryer vents, you get a drill with a big old brush on it, and this dryer vent stuff is blowing at me, and I'm just crying. <gasps> uh, and all this lint from dryers is like sticking to my face. It's so disgusting. And I, <laughs> I'm like getting like, oh, uh, like just crying about it because it's like, it was so real. The burden had lifted for the first time. And I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. The idea that I could put my macaroni, you know, uh, drawing or my finger painting next to the Mona Lisa and think that I would get credit for it and that it would be impressive to others is the same idea that I could, my good works, when I get to the, when I get to heaven, I'm going to put my good works right next to Jesus's and won't God be so impressed with me? I'll put, all of my, I'll put all of my labors right next to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who breathed out all of creation. Won't he be so stoked about all the things that I did with my life? And it, and it sunk in for the first moment like, whoa, it's his goodness. He loved me. I, I don't have to exercise my my power, my authority, my good works, my intelligence, my, my gifting in such a way to earn anything from God. I can sit and I can rest in his work. And I can now look at supernatural miracles as not something that are to be earned, but just good gifts from a father who loves his kids. In, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, are, are mighty miracles done among you by works of the law or hearing in faith, trusting and believing God? This is, this is what we do. We're to trust and we're to believe God. And I, I just, I really do think many of us, we judge ourselves, we, we judge our identity by our merit. And sometimes it works for a little bit. Sometimes we're like, look how much I'm able to do and, and we really feel good about ourselves until God begins to resituate our lives and make us uncomfortable. Sometimes we fall into sin and we can't break an addiction or we can't break a habit or, or every time we get on the road, we lose our salvation because morons are all over the place. <laughs> You know, there's just something, something gets you. And it's like, oh, Jesus, I know the devil had no hold on you, but, but he wasn't driving on I-35, Lord. Like, like you, if it's not the good things you're judging yourself by, it's the bad things. It's the things that you're not doing well or not doing right. Statistically speaking, I know that there are men in here who are bound in pornography, Statistically speaking, I know that there are marriages in this room that will not last because you're hiding your marital difficulties with the pastoral staff and the family of God who loves you and wants to see you through this. Statistically speaking, I know that the, the young women in this room are judging themselves based off of unrealistic bodies that are on Instagram that have been photoshopped all day long. I understand the weights and pressures of identity of what I have to do to become what I'm not but your identity is inherited. It is not merited. Jesus dies on this cross for you and gives you. You know, the rich young ruler, he runs to Jesus, right? He throws himself at Jesus' feet and he says, hey, what must I do to inherit? Which is a funny thing to say, right? Because what do you do to inherit? You don't. Someone else dies. When someone else dies, you inherit. <laughs> I mean, the Really, I know Jesus gave him the law and it was a great response. And there's a big theological, but if I was Jesus, you know, I like to play this game. If I was Jesus and someone comes to me and says, what do I have to do to inherit? I was like, bro, you're gonna have to murder somebody. Like, that sounds horrible. And it sounds like they're probably family. That's rough. 
Like, what do I have to do to inherit? This is going to be in the blooper reel. Dang it. Okay, so if y'all haven't seen these, oh, man, okay. Did they not know? Okay, okay. Last time I preached, they took clips out of context, and they just laughed at it for days. Okay. You don't have to do anything to inherit, right? We inherit, we don't merit. And our identity has to be rooted in that. If you're in the room and you're like, man, my identity right now is addict. My identity is filthy. My identity is never good enough. My identity is by what I do. And I'm exhausted from going out and doing and doing and doing for Jesus. That's my identity. I've been trying to earn. Today, there will be a moment where the prayer team comes up. Can you just do us all a favor? Because we love you, share with someone, repent, and be like, guys, I've just, I believe that I have to merit who I am. And ask for prayer, ask for counsel. This is a miserable, miserable way to live. Okay. There's another thing that, that keeps kind of coming back into my mind that I feel it's worthy of mentioning before we move on to a way forward. Because I, I, I still feel like there's, there's people in the room who think you don't know what I've done. Like, yeah, I understand that, yeah, there's this sin and that sin, but like I've been in this for so long. And I just, I just want to be really like bold and, and almost violent with you. Like, what makes you think that your sin is greater than his blood? It's an extremely arrogant thing to do. It's an extremely arrogant thing to think that your sin is stronger than the blood of God. And to think that what you think about you is more real than the one who made you and what he thinks about you. Just take a moment to let that sink in. One of you is a liar. You are God. And if he says, if he says you are holy, hagios, separate, different, then one of you is lying. And one of you needs to repent for lying. And it's not God. So you can figure out who that is later. The prayer team will help work all of that out. So, the warning is that you can't look to your works to merit, both in who you are and by what you do. The way out is to keep your eyes on Jesus. He, his work, he seated. He died on the cross for your sins. He is seating in heaven. The session of Christ is what actually distributes the gifts. It's he who ascended on high, gave gifts to men, Ephesians 4. It's rooted in his session, and he's coming again, and he will appear in glory. What's the way forward? Because after I say these two things, it's not by what you do, and then I say it's about what Christ has done, then you all walk out going, okay, then what do I do? <laughs> right? So what's a walkaway point, Pastor? What's that take-home moment? Like, how do, I, how do I learn how to do this walking forward? If I'm always going to be tempted to judge myself based off of what do I do, what's my way forward? Let's look at this verse one more time. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Some of your translations might say, set your heart on the things above for Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above. Verse four, skip down to verse four with me. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is Douglas Moo. He, he writes this about the translation difference that some of us have in our Bibles for seek the things that are in heavenly places versus set your heart on things in heavenly places. He gives this commentary. Paul is not saying so much that believers uh, should seek uh, uh, to possess the things above 
as that they are seeking to orient themselves totally to the heavenly realities. We are not to strive for heavenly status, uh, since that has already been freely given to us in Christ. Rather, we are to make the heavenly status the guidepost for our thinking and acting. And by using the, the present tense, Paul is indicating that believers should be constantly occupied in striving for this orientation. So when we are to seek the things that are above, what is Paul saying? He's saying your only job in striving is constantly remembering what Jesus has done. And this is is so cool. Set your heart on these things. Set your emotions on these things. Your desires on these things. Your mind. Constantly remember the incarnation. Constantly meditate on the crucifixion. Meditate on the resurrection and the ascension. Meditate on the beatific vision of when Christ comes again in glory. And this is my favorite part of this passage. My favorite part of this passage is that last verse. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The reason this is my favorite part of the verse is it gives the rest of it context. Because there is this become what you behold principle. There's this become what you behold principle, right? So so when Christ appears in glory and we see him, we will then be like him. So what are we to do in the meantime? Seek him. Try to get the best look at him now that you can. Keep your eyes and your heart and your mind on him because there's something about seeking him that transforms you into him. So it's from a place of pleasure. It's a place from desire, not a place of work. The whole book of Hebrews, strive therefore so that you can enter his rest. What's the striving? It's continuing to believe in the cross. It's continually believing in the resurrection. It's contending for the soon coming king when every enemy is placed under his feet. The enemy is getting louder, God. The persecution is getting stronger, Lord but I'm going to strive to keep believing in what you did and what you will do. And as I fix my eyes and I fix my gaze, it does something in me. There are these present beatific visions. There's a a principle, we we see it in the Old Testament, and some people might quibble over me on this, but I've got more solid points that I'll follow it up with to kind of prove the point. But remember when... when, uh, 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 Jacob's hanging out with Laban. And, and there's like those sticks. And he's like, hey, I'll give you all the spotted sheep. So he goes get sticks and makes spots on them and then sticks them where the, where, the, where the sheep like to procreate. And every time they would gaze on the stick with spots, they'd produce spotted sheeps. And then he changed the wage. And he's like, no, 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 it's just the striped ones. And then he changed the sticks to be striped. And then when they gazed upon the striped stick, they, they, they produced striped sheep. There's a behold, becoming a what you behold principle. Think about Moses in Exodus, right? In Exodus, Moses is arguing with God. I don't know this angel of the Lord that you're gonna send, so show me your glory. If I have had favor in your sight, I beseech you, show me your glory. But then later, I think it's chapter 34, Moses begins to veil his face, why? Why? Because there was something about seeing God that transformed who Moses was. Moses was glowing like a nightlight, not because he had done anything. He had done murdered people. You guys remember this? Moses was a stutterer who, who, who slayed people and hit him in the sand. I love that verse. It's like the, the fastest bar- verse in all of Exodus. It's like, and he saw someone beating a Jew, and he killed him and hit him in the sand. Like, just so quickly. Like, what if your senior pastor's job description was he glows because he's seen God, also he murdered a guy and hit him in the sand? (laughs) Right? Moses is not a good communicator. Moses doesn't earn favor with God because he's got a a clever three-point sermon. Moses was one who beheld. And as he beheld, he became. Do you guys remember the story of Stephen, the martyr? Stephen the martyr, the Bible says that they they noticed that his face shined like an angel. 
And what's happening as his face is shining like an angel? He's rebuking them of their sin, proclaiming Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And as they are hurling the rocks at him, he says, Father, forgive them, just like Jesus does. But as he's doing it, he's gazing up into heaven and he sees the son standing at the right hand of the father. There was something about seeing him that transformed who Stephen was. Our aim, you might say, but Josh, I I don't really know him. How do I see him? I can't make a vision of heaven open up in the sky. There, There is this internal vision we have with the scriptures. There is this internal reality. We don't have to go to the biggest book that was just published by so-and-so charismatic publishing house. We don't have to go to the next charismatic conference and have some leader lay hands on us. We don't have to just take this course. We don't have to just get discipled by that man. All we have to do is dig into the scriptures and gaze intently at a man who died for us. We just have to gaze intently at Jesus. Man, I know cessationists. You know, Charles Spurgeon was a cessationist. He didn't believe that, that, that God performed miracles like he did through the apostles. Did you know that in his biography, it reads that he healed more people in all of North America and Europe combined? All, all pastors, not all pastors, all, all physicians in North America and Europe combined. He saw more of them healed through the preaching of the gospel, laying hands on them and praying for their, their sickness to be recovered. Now, this was a cessationist, mind you, but he had a gaze that was fixed on Christ. I would rather all of you have the wrong doctrine of healing and have your gaze fixed on Christ because then stuff just happens. It's a natural natural reaction of being. And I think that sometimes even we, and I'm a teacher, I love the word of God, I love teaching about the gift of healing and prophecy and all of these other things, but I think sometimes we think if I just get the right teaching, then I'll be able to do this. If I just get enough bravery, then I'll be able to share my faith. If I just get a little bit more, I can can self-help myself into being a better Christian, but you've got it wrong. You think you can graduate from gazing at the cross. And it's not the way it works. Cessationists will do more staring at the face of Jesus than continuationists will staring at the miracles that they long to see. We must be a people who gaze at the death, burial, resurrection, and the coming king. And I'm telling you, this is the price of admission today. Okay? This is, you can't inherit your identity. You You can't merit your identity. You have to inherit your identity. You have to inherit it. And once you've inherited that identity, don't move on from that position. Rinse, wash, and repeat. Stay right there. Because the second you think, okay, now I've got the basics. He died on the cross. Let me move on to the mature stuff. That's when you walk into heresy. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. I'm telling you, we just think, man, my, my wife has had a, 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 she's not here with the kids. The, the kids aren't feeling good, and she's, uh, she's had a vertigo. She's dizzy. She can't, she can't walk in a straight line, you know, and she's had it for a month. And, uh, and we just think, man, if I could just get a little bit more time, and, and, and I just, life is so difficult here and so difficult there, and, and, and if I could just get some relief here, I'd really have peace. If, if, my, if my wife could just get healed, I, I would be able to rest. If I, if I would just have that job that could pay me a little bit more, I could really start saving for retirement and I wouldn't be so stressed out. And we're so eager to look at things and circumstances and situations. And I just remember, man, do you remember when you got saved that first time and there was just stuff in you that wasn't, it was just gone, like the anger that you had, it was just, it just lifted. And those moments where everything around you was just going to hell, but you had Jesus. And there's this peace. There is this power. There is this joy of salvation that I think we so eagerly rob ourselves from all of the doing. Amen? I, I know the, the, the worship team is going to come up and, and sing a song, and there's going to be a time of ministry that we're going to be led in. But there's going to be a prayer team here. And again, I, I'm not, I don't think the whole church is wrestling with this. I don't, I don't think this is a, a pandemic sort of issue, but I can feel the culture pulling us into this way. 
They're pulling us in to do and to become. And identity is such a, a moldable thing. And no, it's imputed to you. It's inherited. It's given to you. You don't have to fight for it. And if you're wrestling with that, I believe Christ's power is here to set you free. And there's just a freedom and a peace that comes with it. I just, I can't wait for you to walk in. Amen? So Father, you know, I, 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 I feel like words fail to express um, how sorry we are for looking at our works. We just so eagerly look at all of the things um, that we're doing wrong or the things that we're doing right as a way of gauging ourselves, gauging our righteousness, gauging our spirituality, gauging our maturity. Um, but Lord, I just, I just ask that you would help us abandon ourself. Would you help us just lose ourselves and just, just be so Christ conscious? Lord, I just pray a grace over our hearts and minds that when we hop in the car, that we don't forget about what Jesus did. When we're doing dishes, that we, we think about baby Jesus sitting in a manger. Where we're, we're at work on a break, we just can't stop thinking about the 24 elders surrounding the throne. And we, we think about all of the pain the world is experiencing, wars and tribulations and trials, that we remember that Christ took a beating for us. That when we feel shame, that we remember that you were naked, you were beaten for us. But I ask that we would not cheapen your work by comparing ours to yours. That we would somehow discredit your sacrifice by thinking that we could somehow achieve or obtain greatness. Lord, would you forgive us? Would you wash us, Jesus? Would you cleanse our heart and make us new? We want the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the desires of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.